please welcome to the stage the president good morning of the intelligence and national security alliance suzanne wilson heckenberg okay i'll try that again good morning Welcome to the fifth annual New IC Empowering Women and Engaging Men. I hope you all enjoyed the networking this morning. There'll be plenty more throughout the day. As many of you all may recall, the past two years we've hosted this program virtually. It was certainly an opportunity to reach a broader audience who's not local to the area, but I'm delighted that we can be here today in person. We have an inspiring day in store of us, featuring an incredible array of speakers who will share their perspectives and hard-earned career insights. But before we get going, I would like to thank our sponsors. Thank you to CGI, Esri, Exeger, GDIT, LMI, Mantech, Northrop Grumman, Periton, Raytheon Intelligence and Space, SAIC, and our small business sponsor, Sim Software. A special thanks to all of them, as well as to our supporting partners, the amazing women of the intelligence community, AWIC, clearancejobs.com, and the Iron Butterfly podcast. <laughs> I'm looking at Meg and Jaffer, and I'm like, okay, AWIC, Iron Butterfly podcast, what else have I forgotten? And we're also happy to welcome members of the press that are in attendance today. Just as a reminder, this event is on the record and will be recorded, and so will be available for viewing next week. Also, you all may be noticing the gentleman to my left, who is Brian Tarallo. He's the managing director of Lizard Brain and our visual storyteller. Brian, anything you want to share with the group? Thank you, Brian, and I would encourage you all to engage actively with Brian. And if you plan to share your thoughts or reactions on social media, only the good ones, that is, uh, please use the hashtag, the new IC, so we can amplify your message to the rest of the community. And I'd also like to thank our amazing events team, who was here yesterday afternoon and through the evening and very early this morning, Toya Cribs and Gadiel Adams, who are probably outside of the room right now working, um, as well as our incredible INSA interns, who are all looking for jobs in the intelligence community, and also all of our staff for putting this day together. I'm hopeful they are not looking for jobs. And I also wanted to mention um, they were busily stuffing swag bags over um, the weekend and earlier this week. Um, we do have swag bags available for you all when you leave. Um, there's lots of fun goodies, and GDIT is the sponsor of the swag bags. They actually are swag bags with yoga mats um, because self-care is very important. I'm kind of in trouble with our accountant because we probably spent a little too much on them, but I thought, I thought it would be a nice um, value add. And so keeping in theme, with this location at Army Navy Country Club today. Out to our left, um, from where the networking space is, we'll ha we're having a putting contest. And there are $10 putts and $50 putts. Um, and one of the prizes will be um, cheese and wine on Tish Long's roof deck for you and three of your guests. So I would encourage you all to participate. All the money raised will go towards NSIF scholarship funds. And I also wanted to mention that it is my pleasure to have here with us Tish, who one of the scholarships is named after, and I would like to welcome our chair, Tish Long, to the stage. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And I won't say anything to the chair of the audit committee about the swag bags. Can you all see me over the podium? <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like I should be up on my tiptoes. Vanessa, I can barely, and I, Gina, I can't see you. So um, hopefully you all can see me. I will tell you, I am just delighted to be here this morning and just so happy to see all of you in person. As Suzanne said, the last two years were virtual. Um, we still had fabulous programs, and in fact, 
could reach a lot more people doing the program virtually. We sold out. So you all are lucky to be here. Not only did we sell out, we were oversubscribed. So thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. So um, just a little background. We certainly have all heard that studies find that a diverse workforce is a competitive differentiator. I think everybody in this room knows that. Yet the intelligence and national security communities still struggle. Struggle to hire, struggle to retain um, as a diverse workforce that is reflective of either the federal workforce or the civilian labor force. And it's a challenge across the entire community. It doesn't matter government, industry, military, civilian, all of the agencies, all of the organizations. So that's what today is all about. Today we will look at non-traditional, novel ways, novel approaches to workforce recruitment and ways that some of you are already working to attract new talent, to foster new perspectives, to value new experiences, and I think most importantly, encouraging new ways of wanting to serve our national security mission. You're gonna hear from so many different people today sharing their personal stories, as well as their insights and what they think about changes that are needed in our community. We're also gonna put everyone to work. We're gonna break up into small groups and actually devise action plans that you can take back and make some immediate progress with in both your work setting and in your personal lives. So um, I think that's a good deal. We certainly want the day to be as interactive as possible. So I know everyone's ready to participate. Ask your questions. As I said, we really have some incredible speakers here today. There are notebooks at your seats. Everyone should have one. Please put them to good use. Now, look around you. Hopefully, you are sitting at a table with folks you don't know. Hopefully you've already introduced yourselves. That means you have already expanded your network. The first challenge I'm gonna give you today is in addition to meeting everyone at your table, during the breaks, and we're giving you ample breaks throughout the day, make it a point to introduce yourself to someone again that you do not know. Your network is really an invaluable part of your career. You never know when you need that lifeline. You never know when you need to reach out to someone who isn't a part of your normal circle, whatever that is, your work circle, your um, personal circle uh, of friends. So work on that network. Work is in that word for a reason. It does take work, like any relationship does to build trust, to build that relationship, to build your network. So when the time comes for audience questions, those amazing interns that Suzanne referenced will be standing by with microphones. We want to be able to hear everyone. And just please raise your hand, identify yourself, and identify your organization, please. During the panels and fireside chats, We'll have, there are note cards on the table. Please write your questions on the note cards and the, in, the interns will collect those and get them to the moderators. All right, we have a full day ahead. I think I've gone through all of the housekeeping things I needed to say as well as again, just um, extend my very, very, very warm welcome to everyone here. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, I'm not sure where she is, but I have seen her, Teresa Shea. Um, Teresa is a member of the INSA Board of Directors. She's also Vice President for Codex at Raytheon Intelligence and Space, and Teresa will introduce our keynote speaker. Let's give her a warm welcome. Good morning, good morning. Now look at this. Ah. Ah. 
I could lift it higher, but I won't, Tish. It's, it's great. It's great. I am just so, so thrilled to be here. And as Tish said, it is wonderful to be back in person, see so many people at such an important event. So Raytheon Intelligence in Space is just so excited to be a sponsor for this event. And we know with diversity and inclusion, it takes real leadership to be able to execute on that. And I think Tish talked about, I think you called it competitive differentiator. You know, we know the data shows that diversity and inclusion results in better business, profits, and sales. And it also is a great motivator for the employee workforce. And finally, I think the biggest thing I've seen from it is you get this different thinking on our hardest problems because you don't want everybody coming from the same experiences. And so I am super, super excited to be able to introduce our opening keynote, Gina Bennett. Many of you probably know Gina. She has had a stellar career at CIA. She was in the senior analytics service there for 34 years, I think, and was one of the first leaders to identify the Osama bin Laden extremist network back in the early 90s, I think that was, around 93. So her analysis and path-breaking career have really cov been covered by I, th by, I think, a lot of the media outlets already, but it has really showcased her critical role in raising the women's voices in the intelligence community. And I know many of us have experienced that and really appreciate Gina being such a leader in that space. In addition, she's the mother of five children, and I already told her that bodes well for grandchildren, which is the greatest stage of life, so I'm excited for her in that future. And she serves as an active honorary board member at Girls Security. She's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Security Studies. And if that's not enough, she hasn't authored one book, she's authored two. And the first book is called National Security Mom. Her second book, released recently, I think, is called National Security Mom 2, America Needs a Time Out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gina to the stage. I'm average. See, see that? Just <laughs> That's my coffee hut. <laughs> that applies to everything I'm about to say, too, so please. Thank you all for, for welcoming me and allowing me to be a part of your day, and especially maybe to give you a, some additional challenges for the morning. Um, this is a big responsibility, being the first official speaker, and I'm very nervous about it because you all are so wonderful. And, I, and so I really, really hope that I can give you some things to think about for the day, um, and maybe with just a little bit of levity. And I say that because I entitled my speech for myself, Apply the Basic Rules of Baking to the Intelligence Community. <laughs> so I'm not a cook, but I do like to bake. And I like to bake because it's usually chemistry. It's very rigid and you know methodical. And as an analyst, I have a very rigid and methodical brain. So forgive me. All right. How do you make chocolate chip cookies? And not just basic chocolate chip cookies, but the really good ones, because the IC deserves a really exceptional chocolate chip cookie. Now, I'm a big fan of Mrs. Fields. Anybody remember Mrs. Fields' chocolate chip cookies? Oh, yeah, okay. You guys are going to, I hope you all ate. <laughs> this is going to definitely make you hungry. And it, there better be some kind of chocolate at lunch, because I'm going to make you want chocolate. So I want to share one of the secrets, just one of the secrets to making the perfect Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookie. You ready for this? You might want to write it down. It's having finely grated dark chocolate in your batter. It's not just about the chips. If you know anything about baking, you know that adding a finely grated ingredient changes everything. 
the mouthfeel, the chemistry of the baking process as all the ingredients heat up, but most importantly in this case, the blending of the chocolate between chips, creating a unifying chocolate experience in every tiny bite. So even if you know nothing about baking and are not even a fan of Mrs. Field's chocolate chip cookies, first of all, I don't trust you, but <laughs> you probably do know one thing. You can't take a sugar cookie, smash chocolate chips into it, and call it a chocolate chip cookie. It's not a chocolate chip cookie. It's not going to taste like one. It doesn't work that way in baking. You have to start from scratch. What does this have to do with the IC? Well, the IC exists to support national, national security. So it's important we get it right. What do we mean by national security? Because a baker has to know what she's baking. So before I entered the intelligence community, it seemed to me that national security had long been confused with national safety. What keeps us safe from invasion and physical harm is not the same thing as what keeps us secure as a democratic republic. Yet for nearly 250 years, we have almost exclusively focused on the former, our safety, and not the latter, our security. Growing up at the largest naval base, bomb drills were a common thing. I used to hide under my desk. Even though, as a little kid, I knew that my desk was not going to keep me from being vaporized by a nuclear warhead. Still, I also didn't think that if the Soviet Union nuked half the country, we would all decide the next day to be communists. A nuclear holocaust wouldn't automatically bring the idea of America to an end. I knew we would fight back. Don't get me wrong, our safety is, of course, critically important. I worked my entire career, all 34 years of it, in counterterrorism, which is absolutely about keeping Americans and our buildings and our facilities safe. But as our military and defense posture against physical threats increased over two centuries, we seemed to remain anchored in a history that equated safety and security. The idea of America was vulnerable to a conquering force at one point, but is it today? Even before the Civil War, Lincoln believed America was no longer threatened by armies from Europe or anywhere abroad. As he so infamously said, as a nation of free men, we must live together through all time or die by suicide. Lincoln predicted that the greatest threat to America's security would come from the temptation to depart from the pathway created by the founders, that men of ambition someday who would attempt to set their own course for America would break with the demands of the Constitution for patience, tolerance, and compromise. Lincoln warned that the idea of America, precariously perched on a foundation of self-government, shared interests, and mutual respect, could be destroyed if citizens look the other way at everyday violations of the Constitution and become distrustful of our democratic institutions. Our nation's security is guaranteed only when the American people commit to unity in their loyalty to the very same document that bitterly divides us. The Constitution requires that America have what it has very little of right now, and that's patience. I believe this is what we in the national security community should be securing, the sustainability of the Constitution against all threats, whether from malign influence abroad, political polarization, citizen apathy, or even self-sabotage and insurrection. It is indeed what we take our oath of office to do. How do we do that? Sustaining the Constitution is not as straightforward a task as defending our borders from invasion. What's the recipe for this? We require more subtle ingredients and nuance in our preparation in the baking process. We can create a new confection without the recipe. And it starts by diversifying our bakers. I'll focus on women in the national security workforce because that's what this conference is largely about. So here's, 
I recognize I'm taking a risk with this, but here's what women in leadership in national security bring to the kitchen. And you can be barefoot or you can wear your best heels, it doesn't matter. Women instinctively know the difference between safety and security. And this very basic, very simple truth should be leveraged as a strength in defining our nation's security. Women are born into a world that threatens our physical safety at every turn. Let's just look at a snapshot of what I'm talking about. What safety, not security, but safety looks like for women in America. Every month, an average of 57 women is shot and killed by an intimate partner. Nearly one million American women alive today have reported being shot or shot at by intimate partners. Four and a half million women have reported being threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. If you are a woman, your odds of being the victim of a sexual assault in this country is one in three. There's more than three women at every table here. 99.5% of the assailants will go free. Can you imagine that if we were talking about terrorists? 61% of American women say they regularly take steps to avoid being sexually assaulted. 52% of women are afraid to exercise in public. We do not take our safety for granted because our safety is not a legal or social norm. Just as the United States must fear all nations with nuclear weapons and the capability to deliver them on US soil, girls as young as toddlers learn to fear boys and men in order to be safe. It's our default. US law and even social norms do not account for what threatens women the most because it's not a foreign adversary, it's not terrorism, it's not even random crime. It is most likely to be from a man we already know. So despite all this, women do not require assistance from an outside source for their security because women decide who they are. I alone am in control of who I choose to be and who I want to become. What's in my head, my heart, my soul is mine alone, and it's not defined by the lack of safety. And that is independence. That steadfast will to be unapologetically who you are and be the person you choose to be is the very essence of security. Because girls and women know this kind of security, we often have different ways of perceiving threats from a personal to a societal to a national and international level. The historical theories, concepts, the frameworks, the strategies, the stakeholders, the leaders and organizations of national security are all anchored around the safety of the state. And they come from a long history of the protector hunter default, articulated mostly by men from a male point of view. These theories and approaches to national and international security are almost universally and uniformly focused on physical security, not integrity of purpose, well-being, and commitment to governance. There has been very little room granted until recently for challenging those theories, concepts, and frameworks. What would the gatherer caretaker do? How would the gatherer define security at a societal, national, and international level? And why do we want to know? Because today's security challenges are intersectional, they're complex, and they are highly nuanced. Today we face the real possibility, the real possibility of never knowing again, as Americans, whether the choices we make are truly our own, or if they have been influenced by narratives curated for us by someone else or something else. We may have territorial integrity in America, but do we have independence? 
We are paying the price, in my opinion, for excluding the gatherer caretaker perspective on security for 250 years. But we have the opportunity to fix that. And that's what this conference, I believe, is all about. This is what presents diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility programs with their greatest challenge. Because all the diversity hiring and retention programs and inclusive and accessibility practices in the world will never get us to a nation that is secure against the threats we truly face to our integrity without this. Assimilating painstakingly constructed diverse work workforces by accepting them to make, a, expecting them to make a difference while also demanding that they do the same thing the same way for the same purpose is equivalent to smashing chocolate chips into a sugar cookie and expecting it to taste like an exceptionally perfect Mrs. Fields cookie. It's not going to. These programs on diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility can only be successful in enriching and strengthening our national security work when we are willing to examine the assumptions underpinning the work itself and recreate the what, the why, and the how from the very beginning. The entire recipe is different. As you take the time today to participate in what is an extraordinarily dynamic program, I urge you to keep something in mind. The IC has been and remains the vanguard for innovation in the national security community, both public and private sector. And yes, I'm biased because I come from the IC. But the intelligence community is smaller. It's built to be agile. It's required always to get the job done against odds stacked heavily against it at every turn. The community has a culture of defying convention and inertia. The result is that when the IC transforms, it leads transformation throughout the national security community without necessarily intending to do so. So you occupy a very important space of influence in transforming America's national security. It's a difficult role to play. Like a parent, you really don't, you really do need to consider how you are modeling behavior for the rest of the US government. And as you do, please don't be content with one default. America and the world are in dire need of much more diversity in the defaults, in the foundations, in the underpinnings of what we do and what we think is national security if we actually want to ensure we have a future. I'm gonna leave it there. Oh shoot, I was hoping that <laughs> I wouldn't have enough time for questions left over, but. Um, yeah, I expect that you all will publish a recipe at the end of the day for your tremendous new cookie. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions for the few minutes that I have. Bet you weren't expecting a talk on baking, huh? <laughs> Hi. Um, hi, Gina. Um, you mentioned earlier about the gathering, um, and uh, you had mentioned earlier to me that you're preparing a hunter-gatherer um, course for Georgetown. So could you tell us a little bit more about what was the impetus for that course, and um, having been on both sides, yeah. um, what your, you know, why you think that the gatherers are so important to the right. IC? So, thank you. It was so kind of you to ask me an easy question. Um, this is the first time I've had to talk in front of an audience post-retirement, so I'm still getting used to being me as opposed to my job. Uh, so my first book, National Security Mom, um, really is a comes from recognizing that what I do at work and what I do at home is really the same thing. Uh, when you secure your family, your kids, your children, you are you you know you can do what you can to keep them safe, right? But the number of hospital visits with five kids um, now they're older, right? Now I'm dealing with broken hearts, 
you know, rejection, losing jobs and COVID, like really heartbreaking stuff. So I can't keep them safe. I think I've helped them keep themselves secure through that self-worth, you know, they understand the value of themselves and they can pick themselves up by their own feet. So the point is, I have been a protector hunter. This is not about sex or gender. It really is about roles. I have been a protector hunter for almost all of my 34 years in counterterrorism. That's the role. I've tried to protect people from terrorist attacks and I was involved in the search for people involved in terrorist attacks. So I know that role well and it's instinctive when you're trying, when you're, when you are fighting against real threat, physical threat, that's an instinctive role. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not trying to say that there's anything wrong with it. But it needs to be blended with other roles, other types of security approaches. So for me, the gatherer caretaker is the most obvious one, but I know there are many others. As a, as a parent, I have to make sure that my children have the resources they need for life, but even more immediately, not just for breakfast, but for lunch when they go to school, uh, for all of their, the, the supplies they need at the school, like all of that, right? The same thing is true for this country. We need resources, not just for now, but for the future. Sometimes the gathering of resources is actually more important than the defending of a border. If you have nothing, what are you protecting? The caretaker role. Do you know, I mean, if you have read Invisible Women, you know this already, right? So with the recent decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, I was very fascinated by one of the footnotes that referenced having children as production in supply and demand. Now, I got, I got a degree in economics, so that spoke to me. Okay, so we're finally, we're finally getting to the point of understanding that mothers and fathers produce Americans. We produce the future workforce. We produce the future leaders. There's a lot of work that goes into that, but it is not in our GNP. Because when they created the GNP, there was a deliberate decision not to put a monetary value on domestic work. So there are so many ways of thinking about how to secure this country against the threats we actually face now and in the future, not just the ones we're comfortable with. And everyone in this room can do it. You have the knowledge and the know-how and the drive and the commitment, and I think the innovative spirit to do it. So just because we haven't committed to securing the sustainability of the Constitution doesn't mean we can't. So that's what I'm talking about. Too afraid to ask me a question, I guess. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Mel Kepler. I have a thought, and then I have a question. I think it's an easy one. Um, so my thought is uh, that I really like this framing that people who grow from birth under constant threat know innately the difference between security and safety. And I just want to encourage us, especially those of us that are white, to acknowledge that it's not just women who grow up under constant threat, that many minorities or... Uh, people with disabilities, people who are queer also grow up under constant threat and also innately understand that. Um, thank you for letting me say that. And the question I had is, if you were to recommend to all of us uh, either to take small, constant baby step actions to try to move from, we're gonna jam some chocolate chips in the sugar cookie to like, let's grate some chocolate in there and see what happens, or recommend hold out, put all your time and energy toward big, systemic, huge change. Where would you point us? Mm -hmm. No, it's a great question, and thank you for your first comment, of course. I'm overly generalizing on everything uh, for, for ease of time. But with the question of where do you start or what could be a baby step, you know, for me, again, trained as an analyst, right, it's always you go in a room and you have an objective. Here's what we want to do. So here's what we want to do. The first thing is asking why. You know, if this is what we want to do, why do we want to do it? What, what are you expecting the consequences of doing that to be? 
because that usually gives you a great place to start asking, oh, okay, if that's what you're actually trying to achieve, here's a lot of other ways of doing it. So for, for example, for me, and anyone who ever worked with me will get be sick of, hear, of listening to this, but as a, as a counterterrorism officer, I've always said that the solution is not the opposite of the problem. The solution to terrorism is not counterterrorism, it's good governance. So it really requires blowing the problem up bigger and not just going with, okay, let's start at this starting point. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a great story when we were searching for bin Laden, for example, where we were, you know, framing the problem by, you know, a narrow perspective. When we brought uh, some researchers in who had, who had helped find the Titanic and learned that the way the scientists went about finding the Titanic was not by narrowing the search, but by expanding it. Eureka. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm a big fan of asking why first, and it's not an accusation, you know? It's just a question. And, and, and I think if anything else, the most important thing challenge requires is the humility to accept it and embrace it. Because if you have a good idea, if you have a great idea, if you have an exceptional Mrs. Fields cookie, you can make it better if you challenge it. It's not gonna get worse. So I hope that helps today. Yes, I guess. Hi, I'm Kelly Hardman. Hi, I'm Kelly Hardman from the FBI. Um, your distinction between safety and security definitely intrigues me because with the Bureau, our mission is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So when I hear how you differentiate between the two, I have to admit, I, I think that we are definitely an organization that is more focused on physical safety. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question to you is, what recommendations would you have as far as trying to influence the discussion and the discourse as far as when it comes to tr strategic planning and how to mm -hmm. include that focus on security as well? No, great question. Um, so I, I also love the Einstein, Albert Einstein quote that if I had one hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and five minutes on the solution. And so in, in part, and forgive me for the long-winded answer here, but having been in that role for so long until very recently, um, I've always felt like part of the problem was we, not only do we go to our default because it's known and, and, and it's comfortable and we're, and we're good at it and we need to continue to get better at it, the safety side of it, but we also, uh, you know, in, in, in thinking about looking at it a different way, we don't really know where to start and we think also, um, that's not what the intelligence community, for, for one thing, is created to do. So the problem is the mirror imaging in some ways. It's like we are thinking, well, that's, that's too hard of a problem, and that's not what other countries have been doing to threaten us, or other adversaries have been doing to threaten us, so let's just stick here where, where we can. But you know, for me, you know, thinking it's more Sun Tzu, right, knowing your enemy, um, understanding that your enemy, in many ways, understands our vulnerabilities better than we understand them the, ourselves. So we got the know the enemy, but we don't really know ourselves that well. Um, I'm a big believer of um, NSC 68. I know NSC 68 was a lot of propaganda. But if you go back and read what the authors of the containment strategy said about the fundamental purpose of the United States, it was about the embrace of diversity. It was about tolerance. It was about self-restraint in order for everyone to experience liberty. It, it, was, it, it stated very clearly that compulsion is the negation of freedom. So if you wanna know where maybe Putin or others got their blueprint for how to destroy the United States, I, I think they thought that that's what we really meant was our strength. 
and any strength can be turned into a weakness. So I, I think fundamentally it starts with framing it as, look, we need to understand how our enemies are exploiting us. And yeah, it's uncomfortable, the, what the implications of that, but we have to try. If they're trying to manipulate how we think and how we decide and make choices, then we have to meet them in that space and accept it as, as much of a threat to the idea of America as a physical one, maybe more so. Suzanne with ENSA, so I'm going to take the privilege of asking the last question, and this is more in your role as an author. Your first book, I believe you wrote in 2019, correct? Was it published in 19? No, 2008. So you wrote it while you were oh. with the government. Mm -hmm. A, five kids, mm -hmm. a book, and CIA, so going through approvals can be sometimes challenging. How did you manage all of that? Well, uh, you know, ironically, it was the CIA's idea. <laughs> so, in 2006, um, we had a conference, uh, I, I think Carmen Medina was there, and we, we did a, um, for the women's uh, group in, in the agency, we had a one-day event on, or it was a lunch, um, on uh, work-life balance, which is frankly a phrase I hate, but nonetheless, <laughs> I believe in career lifetime, because I don't think you can balance it in small but we had a conference on, on work-life balance, and I was one of the speakers, and they had asked me as, you know, a mother of, I think I had, how many did I have then? Yeah, I had all five of them by then, 2006. Yeah, I did, I did. <laughs> um, so as a mom of five, CT officer, all that stuff, like, this woman might know something about work-life balance. Well, I told them, I was like, no, actually, I don't, because what I have realized is that it's the same job. I'm involved in the same job. And if you think countering terrorists are, is hard, toddlers and teenagers at the same time sucks. Which is what I was doing. I had a baby too, so add that into the mix. At any rate, the point being, I, I, I stood up and I, and I did exactly that. You know what? What I do at work, you know, teaching how to tell the truth, clean up after yourself, you know, don't give in to a bully, um, don't say anything you're gonna regret, you know, like if, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all, uh, things like that. And afterwards, the public affairs office came to me and said, hey, can we interview you for our external website? And I did, and then of course when that happened, a, a women's magazine came to them and said, hey, can we interview her and have her right there? That happened, and of course after that happened, a publisher came and said, hey, can you make this into a book? So it was really the CIA's idea. <laughs> just, just gonna say. <laughs> Oh, okay. Thank you. Hey, and you know, a, a shout out to Gina for making INSA the first place post, mid, whatever we are in COVID um, to come out and speak in person. Um, we genuinely really appreciate it. And also for, um, I'm trying to find her over here, for making yourself kind of vulnerable today. We re really appreciate um, your being part of, of the program. And